So my name's Sharina Snossius and I'm from iMark Online. Um, this is the iMark Mets Arena Live, which is in its third episode uh, in partnership with Global Victoria and the resources team at the Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions. Um, also, our uh, technical partner, Mining Plus, today represented by Aaron Spong, who many of you know, are uh, joining us today. So we thank both of those partners for their support for the iMark Mets Arena series. Um, today's episode is quite an interesting one, and as I've just said to some of the gentlemen, uh, it is uh, definitely one of our most popular ones that we've had so far. The problem statement for today's episode was around the topic of planning. So as we plan the next generation of mines, industry is a requirement for a different level of thinking, including rapid project and underground development, with an objective of non-entry mining. How to do this, however, can be difficult and requires innovation in mine planning with a focus on digital and technological specific solutions. Um, discussed today by Lino Menka, Group Manager from Mining Studies at Newcrest Mining. Uh, we'll hear more from him about this particular problem and some of the challenges that they may face there at Newcrest or what are they looking for. It also features our pre-qualified five METS companies, um, High Size, Beck Engineering, Data Mine, Emicent, and Watrix. Q&A after each presentation from Aaron will be made to um, each of the speakers, but we also obviously encourage our audience to take part. The main days of iMark Online um, take part over the, 20, the first week of the, um, the 23rd of November, um, and then following with other uh, things uh, on the following week. The virtual expo will be there, one-to-one -one business meetings, um, the METS showcase, and also um, several content sessions from uh, industry and CTO leaders, as well as technolo technology and innovation sessions. So we really do hope you can join us for iMark online and you can reach out to me for more information about that. Without further ado, and before I lose my voice entirely, I'm gonna pass over to our first speaker for today, um, Lino Manka from Newcrest, to talk to us a little bit about the problems and the challenges that they face um, there at Newcrest, but as an industry as a whole. Thanks, Lino. Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you, Shireen. Um, great topic um, and uh, very relevant to, uh, to, what's, to the sorts of issues that Newcrest faces. Just go to the second slide, please. Um, so this is taken from a paper written by my boss, Herman Flores, in 2014. And uh, it's by no means an exhaustive list of, of issues that are facing the mining industry in general. So certainly in a technical sense, uh, grades are getting less. Um, it's not getting any easier to mine, uh, mine out, to, to build mines. Uh, so we're facing deeper ore bodies and that brings a number of challenges, of course. So um, <clears throat> it's always uh, hits the bottom line, the value of a project, faster access to get to ore. So the deeper we go, the longer it takes to access uh, so we're looking for faster methods of accessing, uh, gaining reliable deposits, lower ore grade. Um, most of the, the great deposits have already been mined out. Uh, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. So it's getting tougher. Um, and uh, effective working hours as well. As you get deeper, getting people to those work areas is becoming longer. So getting that effective work time out of our crews. Um, the technical challenges that are thrown up, longer periods to study, it's far more capital intensive to, uh, to build these mines. And so therefore, a great deal of effort goes into capturing the data and undertaking those studies. Um, so yeah, and, and of course, being larger um, or lower grade, we're looking at larger mining methods with higher productivity. Uh, so that's contributing to the technical issues that we have. Of course, the economic issues, lower commodity prices, although we've seen a good run with gold in the last uh, few months, we've had a hit but over the last 24 hours, but uh, it's, uh, it's been a while coming. Higher capital costs, the labour costs um, and energy costs as well, of course. So uh, power is only, only on the up at the moment uh, with, the, with the power systems that we have in Australia. Uh, social license to operate, we've got a number of com competing demands to, uh, to staying open and, and achieving our social license to operate. So again, uh, key item that we need to consider. 
and skills. Uh, it is getting harder to retain people. Uh, and even um, in recent years, with the number of graduates coming through, um, it's getting harder to, uh, to attract people uh, to an industry. Mining uh, has become, unfortunately, it seems unpalatable. Uh, so it's getting those people that, uh, that is becoming problematic. If you go to the next slide, please. So conversely, I uh, found this, this uh, information on the web. Uh, so some solutions that could, uh, could be out there and perhaps some of our METS people could talk to it today. So alternative and renewable power, all the old favorites, solar, wind. Um, are there others out there as well? For example, generation, we've got these hot, deep mines. Could we do more to actually install uh, turbines, the old Pelton wheels, for example, or something better than that to provide power from a situation that we have. Automation, of course, is increasing. Um, ore sorting is, is something that's uh, been looked at in uh, quite some detail. Uh, so if we can reduce the amount of waste that we're moving, makes us far more profitable and uh, can bring on more deposits uh, economically. Ventilation on demand, that's been around for a while where we can have ventilation systems that are driven by uh, numbers of personnel or equipment in an area. So taking that one step further. Um, high accuracy GPS, not really not applicable in a uh, underground situation, obviously. However, there are systems there that you could can put in place to monitor people's movements that can help with that tracking and help with um, optimizing schedules and personnel movements. Drones, I see there's a presentation coming up about mapping using drones. Um, that's that's uh, becoming more relevant in the underground mining space. It's good to see a lot of activity occurring there. Uh, 3D printing and modular equipment. How can we turn out some tools or uh, items that are, uh, can be more consumable and cheaper for use in a mining environment? The 3D imaging aspect, so converting the drone technology to 3D imaging or other tools and methods. Data optimization and machine learning. Um, so we're seeing that coming online. Um, we've seen that quite a bit with uh, geotechnical, for example. Core scan's been around for a while, core scan technology. Applying that sort of technology to machine learning for geotechnical purposes, not just geological purposes. So how can we get more information out of um, highly valuable core that we, that we source? Equipment management. How can we use real-time tracking of people and personnel, uh, perhaps in an artificial intelligence sense? So Facebook and other social media, they use um, big data mining to understand trends. There's a lot of data captured in mines. Can we use those systems in line with, um, with AI to perhaps uh, give us trends that could lead to better decision-making? Uh, wearables on workers, so having a constant real-time monitoring of personnel for their health. Um, and also, again, where we can utilize resources um, better. Alternative powered vehicles, uh, something that um, the underground mining industry is very interested in is uh, the use of alternative power, uh, battery powered loaders and trucks, for example. So Sandvik Artisan, those, uh, those units that could be used in in a greater sense to, uh, to reduce, first of all, create a better working environment, but ultimately if we can move people away from those areas altogether. Thanks, Lino. Thank you. Um, Aaron, did you want to uh, ask Lino one of those questions that we received? He thought he might be able to answer for us. Yeah, sure. Just find that on my list. Um, I know one of them is, or well, there's actually quite a few questions that have come through regarding advancing down to our deposits um, using non-traditional drill and blast activities. And there's a lot of talk in the industry around TBMs or I'll say TBMs for now. How, how can, I suppose one of the questions we've got is TBMs can be very high instantaneous advance rates when compared to the rates achieved by drill and blast methods. But when they averaged out over the entire project, how much better than drill and blast advance rate can they be? 
So the sorts of numbers that I've seen for TBMs are up around 400 metres a week. Uh, so considerable. Um, but that's not, that's not sustainable. That's um, probably a maximum rate. Um, compared to a drill and blast situation, oh, I think Vern Cut did a record last year, well, or Barminko have done a record of 400 metres in a month. So uh, look, they certainly in an instantaneous sense are, are far more productive, but there is of course all of the logistics in setting up and maintaining a TBM. Um, also far more, far more uh, technically difficult as well, particularly in remote areas. So uh, they're the sorts of issues that I see. Unfortunately, we need to still try and overcome all the TBM manufacturers and, and getting those systems in place where they are perhaps more uh, user-friendly in a, in a rugged um, remote environment. Thanks, Shereen. And well, that's quite was quite a list there, Lino. But I think we can help with one area, which is the more reliable ore body knowledge. And today, I want to introduce technology that does this and focus on how it can be used to help caving operations reliably meet their design um, performance. So I've shown a, a picture on the screen there, which shows. Uh, a number of the potential issues that can hamper a, a caving operations performance. And these can lead to uh, fat fatalities, losses of millions of dollars, or in, in extreme cases can even lead to a, a cave becoming uneconomic. The, some of these risks can be managed if the geology is known way that we investigate them at the moment, which is drilling, doesn't map structural detail well. Can I have the next slide? The technology I want to introduce is 3D seismic. The 3D seismic is a proven technology to delineate structural detail. It uses sound waves to provide an image of the whole rock mass. As you can see over in the top right hand side there, we get a cube, continuous cube of of data that allows you to see between the drill holes, beneath the drill holes and beyond the drill holes to get a, a clarify the whole picture of the, the rock. And HiSIS has successfully deployed this in, for mineral exploration for the last decade. It's very effective at mapping structures due to the high density of data and it also maps variations in rock competency. So we see the early application of these surveys can minimise the chance a cave will be compromised by unforeseen geology. Next slide. One of the ways that we're extending the, the technology is the use of uh, fibre optic cables as vibration sensors. This is absolutely amazing technology because you can monitor vibrations along the full length of the cable with access just to one point one end of the cable. And the cable itself is essentially disposable in cost. So we can set up on the side, uh, off the top of a, a caving operation. So lay out the cable before the cave begins. And then we can continue to uh, provide time-lapse images of the progression of the cave as, it, as mining proceeds. You can see over on the right, far right-hand side at the top, uh, there's some images there and you can see some slopes intersecting the uh, cross-section through a seismic image. And the seismic's very effective at mapping uh, broken ground and, and mine openings. So it should be very effective at mapping the progress of the cave. And we can also look at the micro seismic events to show where the ground is moving and then put that in context of the seismic event, uh, the seismic images which show very clearly where the, the structures are. So which structures are, are moving and how big they are. Just uh, to finish off, just want to acknowledge a couple of our partners, the Institute of Mine Seismology, experts in microseismic and Terra 15 who build and uh, have developed the optic cable sensors. Thanks, Greg. Aaron, do we have some questions or do you have some questions for Greg? 
Yeah, I've probably got one uh, from that and just leading back into Lino's initial um, presentation. Greg, as we go deeper, as Lino suggested, do, do you see much variation in the data that you pick up? Obviously, um, we can only drill so far and we can only send so far. Do we see much variation as we go deeper? Because this does have a big effect on the mine plan overall. Um, there is yeah, significant variation. That's one of the big advantages of the seismic technique is that it, uh, the resolution uh, doesn't really diminish as a factor of depth. It's the, the one geophysical technique where, where that's the case. And so the techniques used to look all the way down to the base of the crust. So depth isn't an issue and the resolution is maintained. Yeah. It's very, very handy information if you are tunnel boring and as Lino mentioned, you need some very good data to undertake tunnel boring. So it could be a good, uh, a good product to marry up with. Um, Greg, we have a question from Joe Kakuza asking, um, how much of costs of 3D seismics come down over the last 10 years? Uh, well, they, they've come down uh, over, they continue to come down over a long period of time because of uh, Chinese manufacture has brought down the cost of the equipment enormously um, mm. and the technology's moved along a lot, uh, miniaturised the equipment. So, so the costs are coming down. We use nodes now, so we don't need cables between equipment, which means less personnel out in site, um, easier to move these these things around. So they, it continues to, to reduce. Okay. And the fibre optics is another way that we can lever off. <clears throat> okay. Um, thanks so much for that, Greg. We'll move on to our next speaker now, who's Alex Campbell from Beck Engineering. Alex? Good everyone. I guess just building off Lino's introduction, the first thing I wanted to talk about was data collection and integration. And one thing that sort of ties all of the presenters together today is they're really focusing on data collection, integration into the mine planning process and visualization of, of, of large amounts of data that uh, can be used in the mine planning and decision making process. Um, I've just got a few examples here from, from an underground and open pit operation of different types of data that's being rapidly collected with, um, with modern instrumentation, whether it be laser scanning for fragmentation or deformation monitoring, slope stability. There's a lot of instrumentation available now for cave propagation, flow measurement, um, rapid grade assessment, and even groundwater monitoring. I guess where Beck Engineering really fits into this is as part of the mine planning process, we need to understand that everything's connected and having that data during the mine project phase or the planning phase and then during operation is critical for decision making. And as Lena also mentioned, mines measure lots of data and they don't do much with a lot of that data. A lot of that data sits on hard drives and actually doesn't get used. Can I just have the next slide, please? So <clears throat> by collecting lots of data, you can actually, technology is no, no longer a, a, a barrier in the planning process. There is techniques that are available now where you can actually visualize all of your data together in the one piece of software and actually understand how your mind plan and how your mind is going to evolve with respect to the physics and the physical simulations or numerical simulations that we conduct. So you can see the, the cyclic process of, of mind planning and mind design and really what we specialize in is, is simulation aided engineering. So we take all the data that's available for a mine, whether it be uh, an example from the, the previous presenter, whether it be um, the mine plan, mine schedule, geology, rock mass data, drilling records. We can take all that information and run a, a complete simulation of a, of a mine plan and identify vulnerabilities. And really what we target is fast tracking an optimum mine plan by reducing or eliminating vulnerabilities as soon as possible within that design phase. Next slide, please. Now, within that process, not only is it used for the planning in the project phase, but we can also use the information to, for decision-making during the actual uh, mining of a project as well. So I just have two quick case studies here. The first one's getting it right. Now this is a block caving mine with a large open pit above. 
And during the construction of the open pit, uh, sorry, during the construction of the underground, they were actually able to use their data and use numerical simulations to forecast the, the rock mass response to that operation and to keep it, uh, keep that open pit in operation for another year. Um, a year longer than was actually planned to be in, in, in production. So the, the, looking at hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, getting it wrong, I think this, the, those pictures there really speak for itself. Now, this is a block cave um, with a really poor sequence and a really poor plan that was not executed well and they paid really dearly for it. Uh, so it's just, just to show two examples of where data integration and good planning uh, and numerical simulation can lead to really good outcomes. Thanks, Thanks Alex. Alex. Aaron? Yeah, probably just leading to that was um, a question we have is how important is change management and stakeholder engagement during the digital transformation process on a mine side? So obviously it was quite clear that having incorrect data and handing that over or, you know, through the process uh, can lead to a very poor mine plan and or the results of a mine plan. Um, any yeah. commentary around that? It's, it's really about, well, I guess there's a few things to answer that question. Stakeholder engagement is certainly one, um, but actually being able to use all your data and integrating it together into a central platform to visualise and communicate those messages to people uh, and actually utilising all of the data um, in, in one place, which is, which is really critical. And I think Dylan will probably talk about that in a little bit. Thanks, Alex. Okay, if there's no other questions for Alex, we'll go on to um, Dylan's presentation. Yeah, great. Thank you, Shireen. Yeah, I guess uh, our goal at Data Mine is to make planning easier for people uh, so that they can get accurate um, plans done and as quickly as possible. And it really is our role, um, similar to what Alex was mentioning, is we want to bring in as many data types and sources of information as possible. So if you went back 15 years ago uh, in mine planning, probably the, the really big innovation was adding lots of detail, realistic detail, to long-term mine plans and being able to really do much more accurate um, time estimates. So there were a few caves that were built um, probably around the, the turn of the century that came online about a year late uh, compared to the original estimates. And then with new planning tools where there was more detail and, and the opportunity to animate schedules and visualize things a lot better, um, you saw that the caves that were developed in the last 15 years have generally come in much closer to the original estimates done in feasibility studies. So, so that was a big change. And, uh, and things, of course, keep moving on. Uh, so this slide just shows some of the, the themes uh, that, that we're working with in the moment in our planning tools. And for sure, we're, we're trying to continually automate processes. Uh, people want to get a lot more scenarios done. Uh, we may be dealing with looking at different drive orientations in a cave based on the sort of modelling that Alex would do. Um, and we might want to look at a lot of different options and how that uh, impacts the production build-up. So, uh, so we want to be quicker at our, our planning scenarios and putting really sophisticated tools in people's hands that, uh, that are easy to use. Uh, and there, there's a real trick in that. So we're always looking in that direction. Uh, you could just go back a slide for a second. Uh, we're also seeing a trend to much shorter term focus. So rerunning plans um, with new data, uh, not just once a year or once a quarter, but uh, every week and sometimes daily. So that's an area we're working on a lot. Um, as well as incorporating new data types. And Stefan will show us some examples uh, of the type of data they're collecting with Emerson at the moment. Uh, okay, next slide. And just with the IMARC themes around innovation and collaboration, I thought it was worth mentioning our approach on the collaboration side. Uh, we certainly participate in a lot of formal research programs. Um, we also work with customers and specific experts in, in certain fields and look to use our reach and our presence in, in mining operations to make that available to people. Um, and probably the other aspect is, is 
working on integration and we're constantly um, doing point-to-point -point integrations, which we feel is the, the most efficient way of, of connecting with, with other data sources. Next slide. So just to, to finish off, this is just a, an example of the sort of things that we're seeing. Uh, so we have automated tools for building geological models these days. You can create a stoke design very quickly at increasing levels of detail automatically. Uh, we can automate blast hole layouts. We can transfer them digitally to automated drills. Technology Stefan will show you in a moment uh, can be used to collect data um, completely autonomously. And downstream from there, we have other tools that can be used to interpret that data and feed it back into your planning process. So a lot of this uh, type of information and types of processes is available now. And uh, I guess a lot of the work we're doing is, is sitting down with customers and making sure that they're exploiting these opportunities. So that's, that's something we're quite focused on. Back to you, Aaron and Shireen. Thanks, Dylan. Okay. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, Dylan, just one question I've got with that. I know that Datamine does the full um, exploration through the reconciliation uh, suite with your software. And we just talked about the data gathering and we capture a lot of data on a mine site. How can we guarantee that the data we're capturing is correct to inform the right plan? Because uh, obviously if there's any data that's incorrect, it can have a significant impact, especially further down the chain um, on the, the mine economics. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, Aaron. Um, certainly in terms of just pure data quality, there are a lot of tools built into various systems for catching duplicates and, and that sort of thing. Um, and in terms of measurement, it, it can be a challenge. So the accuracy that you might get, say from a wave ridge compared to uh, some on-stream analysis in your plan could vary quite a bit. And uh, it's been an interesting one for us recently acquiring Snowden uh, where the reconciler tool is really designed to solve this problem, looking across a, a whole process and identifying these sources of variance in measurement uh, and using that as a tool to improve data over time. So as a continuous improvement uh, process. Uh, we have some other um, software as well that allows you to use statistical processes to adjust measurements that you don't trust. And there's a whole field of mathematics behind that that's quite interesting as well. So yeah, those are some of the things that we're working on in that space. Thanks, Dylan. I've got one here from the floor, um, also about again about the data, and um, there's probably two parts of this question. How is the data being managed with different systems and different data types uh, for standard mine data, such as block models, as a good example? Um, do we need a more standardised and open file format for the data transport? transfer in real time and reduce any errors in manipulation to go from one format to another. Yeah, yeah, also very topical. I think it comes up a lot. People struggle with, with managing data generally. Um, we're supportive of, of efforts to come up with standard um, file structures and formats, and, and we always make sure we write drivers for those. I guess the problem that introduces is you may end up with data stored in triplicate, the original source, the standard format, and then wherever you're taking it to. And so that in itself becomes a proliferation of storage and data times. So our preferred approach is point to point and to use original sources um, for the purpose of maintaining integrity. Um, so that, that's the way we like to work, um, but we do accommodate other approaches it's certainly a, an industry challenge, that one. Yeah, I think that was a general question. So, I mean, Alex and Greg, do you have any comments um, on, on, on that as well about um, the data and sharing it? I think the most critical thing is actually integrating all the data into a central platform. It's um, particularly data from um, completely different sources, whether it's you know just related to, to mine planning or whether it's data from Emerset, for example, or from Hisense, or from all sorts of other instrumentation and data collection techniques, actually being able to visualize it in the one 
platform together um, and not only in 3D, but also over time as well um, is, is, is really important. I think, Lino, you mentioned this in your opening uh, remarks around the data as well, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, data is king for us in, in a study space. So uh, certainly anything we can do to, to improve that data transfer and faster manipulation, collection, all of those things are of massive benefit. Okay. We might, uh, thanks for that, Dylan. We'll move on to our next speaker now, Stefan from Emerson, uh, who's obviously um, here with us today. So, Stefan. Thanks, Shireen. Um, and thanks for, for the invitation to be part of this panel. It's really, really interesting. Um, so, yeah, just from our perspective, I think the, the part of the, the, the puzzle that we're addressing is capturing 3D data um, throughout the mine, even in challenging parts of the mine and doing that rapidly um, and easily. So, obviously, 3D data is, is pretty critical for any kind of digital transformation. Um, and as we mentioned before, it really helps with the sort of continuous monitoring of areas and reducing the planning cycles. Um, traditional methods obviously have been used for, for a while and very successfully, but they do often, they are often quite time consuming. There are many areas that you just can't access with you know, traditional survey tools. Um, and obviously you need fairly skilled personnel to go and capture that data. Um, image on the on the right there is an example of an entire mine that was captured using uh, hover map our system and i'll sort of talk a bit more about that um, and that that capture was done in about a week so it is possible to capture an entire mine in, in that kind of time frame so if you go to the next slide um so yeah how are we doing this is basically bringing our background in robotics and drone autonomy um into the mining and underground mining space and we developed uh, a payload which we call hover map and um, it's basically a two-in-one system that does both drone mapping and autonomy. So it's a plug and play. You can connect this to the drone. And when it is connected to the drone, it basically acts as the eyes and the brain for the drone, um, allowing the drone to be sent off autonomously underground um, beyond communication range um, without GPS to, to map and explore. And it's using a LiDAR sensor to do that, that navigation aspect, the same kind of LiDAR sensors that are used on self-driving cars. And then we're collecting all that data and we post-process it using our SLAM algorithm to generate the, the point clouds. Um, so because it's a SLAM system, it, it doesn't need GPS, it doesn't need to be sitting on a tripod, it can do all this while it's in motion. Um, so built as a, as a drone payload, but then you can detach it from the drone with a quick release mount. So um, click on a handle or click it onto a backpack. Um, mounted to a vehicle, we've got a, a drop cage as well for lowering down all passes and, and uh, vertical shafts. Um, you can see it's mounted to the front of a, a bogger bucket as well. So very versatile um, standalone mapping system as well, but when it's on the drone, it, it automates the drone flight as well. So that, yeah, the benefits there is it's really um, quick to capture the data. I mean, if you're driving, it's as, as, as fast as you can drive underground. Really easy to use because of the Autonomy. Um, it's hard, <laughs> very hard to fly a drone on the ground, believe me. Um, but with Hover Map, it's it's uh, just a few taps on a tablet and it does everything for you. I've mentioned mentioned the versatility um, and key is it allows to get into areas that you couldn't access data before um, because of uh, sort of non-entry. Um, and then the data quality that we're getting um, is orders of magnitude in terms of uh, the, the point density and the coverage. Um, compared to some of the traditional techniques. Uh, and then on the last slide, I've just got a bunch of examples of data that has been captured and, and various use cases. So this is both drone-based capture and um, being mounted on the tether or on, on a vehicle, but you can see we can get into stopes, all passes, vent shafts, uh, draw points is another big one to get in and, and um, map hangups. Uh, so that's been dealt with. Can also be used above ground on uh, stocks, uh, stockpiles, and ROMs. Um, and then, obviously, with the data, you can do things like uh, uh, volumes, fragmentation analysis, uh, mapping blast holes, over that break, under break. Um, we can pick up ground support as well to do audits of ground support. So, um, and we're learning every day about you know different use cases from this this rich 3D data that we're capturing um, and, and seeing yeah, a lot of different use cases. Excellent. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, I've probably got two questions for you. Um, one would be, is there any limitation whatsoever from an underground perspective with, with um, hover map? Um, 
on the drone itself, limitations are flight time of the drone um, and uh, space requirements. And we can fly through gaps of around 1.8 meters, but obviously we're not going to get into um, really narrow slopes or, or small shafts. Um, we have a drone now which can fly for around half an hour. So, I mean, that does give a lot of coverage underground and, and most slopes you can map in five minutes. Um, other challenges for drone flight are things like dust. Um, obviously, but the downwash can, can kick up dust, but we've got fairly robust ways of dealing with that now. It can, it can detect that it's in a dusty environment and then back itself out of there, uh, even, even flying blind if it needs to. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of challenges with flying drones on the ground, but I think we've, we've overcome uh, obviously a significant number of them. I mean, the system's been used for nearly two years now across the world in other ground lines. Um, but then other challenges I yeah, can go into as well from a mapping perspective. And, and I suppose my second question was uh, with, with the data that you capture and can, can it be uploaded um, for use instantaneously? Because uh, that's probably one of the challenges in the underground mine historically. You had to send a surveyor down to, for example, to map a stope, set a CMS up, let it do its, um, do its thing for an hour or so and then get back up. Um, manipulate the data and provide it to the engineer to give the information, that, that takes time. Is, it, is this now becoming more instantaneous to get that information to the people that need it? Not instantaneous yet, but it's, it's definitely a lot quicker. So the, the processing time after the flight takes about two to three times the flight time. So if you've flown for five minutes, process would 10 to 15. And then once you bring that into one of your mind planning tools, the first step is usually georeferencing. Um, and there are workflows now with some of the, the major sort of software vendors that can bring that down to around five minutes per scan. So bring it in, uh, crop it a bit, clean it, locate your uh, control points and your reference to the, to the mine model and then convert the point cloud into a, a solid model for doing volumetric. So um, uh, yeah, that workflow is down to, to, to minutes now. So usually our customers will capture and the, the capture can be done by a non-expert, doesn't mean to be a surveyor, um, just anybody who can operate the system. They start processing underground by the time they've got to the surface, they've, they've got the, the raw point clouds and then they bring it into their uh, the mine planning tools or, or survey tools. It's impressive. Thanks, Stephanie. I mean, there's this question here um, from Christian, um, who I believe is actually dialing in from um, Chile uh, or has called in from Chile, which I can't imagine what the time is over there at the moment. Um, Christian from Kidelco and he's asking the question and it's a general question for all the speakers um, about uh, getting data processing and interoperability challenges in underground operations. Um, how these platforms can manage IoT miscommunication or connectivity issues between hangouts or other operational challenges when we have missing data between periods in large scale operations. Um, there is, uh, is there any opportunity to create virtual sensors in caving operations, um, et cetera? Uh, missing, missing data over large periods of large scale operations is not a good thing to have. Um, you don't want to be missing too much information because it's yeah, data you'll never get back again. So I don't know if anyone else in the panel here has got any solutions or offer any suggestions. But Christian, uh, you might be able to provide Christian. Yeah, I'm just wondering like how we can actually, uh, because all these platforms use, actually use data, you know, like we're processing data, we are acquiring data, but how do you actually, how we can manage uh, when we don't have data or we're not acquiring data in real time, especially in real, in large scale operations. You know, for instance, I don't know if you guys know El Teniente Mine, but as a really, uh, it's a massive underground mine and we have a lot of like micro mines inside our mine site. And some of our caving operations, uh, we don't have a hundred percent of monitoring, especially when we are extracting, you know, um, when we are all doing our manning plan. So I'm just wondering if we, there's any like solution or any, for instance, alternative solution to actually um, provide or try to input this data, these uh, holes of data, because you know we're doing hang. Else we do we have to do like um, we have to do blasting and we have to actually interfere in the actual operation. Many of our sensors and cameras are disrupted. So how we can actually manage and process all this stuff? You know that's uh, kind of my question. You know like how these platforms can actually help the operation to 
to plan in the short term if we are lacking data from a specific mindset or we have a, we are blind in, in, in a specific <laughs> mindset. So that's kind of the question, you know? Yeah, uh, thanks, Christian. Uh, I think uh, obviously if you've got missing data that's not in real time, I think the, the answer is to get the, get the technology into those minds where you might be flying a little bit blind so you can capture that data when you need it rather than relying on word of mouth through Hangouts or whatever, uh, whatever form of communication you're using. So it might be a good time to start implementing, or thinking about implementing some uh, technology into your mind, into those black spots, I suppose you'd call them. Stefan, any comments on, on that? Um, I mean, it's, all, it's difficult if, if you're trying to capture a time series and you've missed a slice of time, you can't go back in time to, to recapture. But obviously if you've got, um, technology which allows you to capture regularly and, and efficiently then you, there's less chance of missing out that sort of slice of time um, i think the general sort of uh, trying to solve the problem of, of inferring um, um, in between data where you've got gaps obviously there are machine learning um, and big data techniques to try and infer um, missing data or missing information and make us um, yeah, make inferences, but um, we, we're certainly not applying um, any of those kind of techniques in, in what we're doing at Emerson's. But uh, I would be surprised if somebody's not looking into that from a mining perspective to, to make inferences from data. Leno, do you have any, um, perhaps any advice for, for Christian there? Um, look, I, I think perhaps I, I mentioned in my talk, maybe an opportunity is to, um, with the big data mining approach, so you, I, I don't know what the answer is if you've missed data, but perhaps a greater way to bridge the gap is to go in and seek trends from previous history based on big data mining to bridge that gap in, in the instance that you do have a loss of data. So that doesn't really answer your question, Christian, as a way to make sure you capture the data, but at least may, may assist in bridging. If, if I can just jump in, I think I might have a, a, a bit of feedback for you, Christian. I'm, I'm working on... I do a lot of work for, for quite a few block caves of, of similar, some of them of similar scale to El Tante. And this one example, um, you know, Grasberg block caves in construction now, it's just propagating through to the pit. Um, now they've got some excellent instrumentation in some areas and they're missing instrumentation in others just because it's not physically possible to, to install that data. Now what we do is you can use all the information you have, knowing the black spots that you have with your data and use numerical simulations to assess and calibrate and validate those simulations and provide forecasts and some of the best forecasts that you can be done with the information that you actually have to fill in those gaps. And then you continue to monitor your other areas, whether it's seismicity or um, laser scanning on the footprint for deformation or whether it's um, cave beacons and smart markers, for example, we integrate all this data. Uh, I'm based in Brisbane and we can do it all remotely from, you know, one of the largest and most remote mines in the world. So, you know, if you tie it into a, a post COVID world or even during COVID, this is, you know, all this data can be achieved remotely um, and be used to address the mine plan and make decisions. And that's what we do in fortnightly meetings with, um, with Grasberg. Thanks, Alex. We might uh, move on to our next speaker and come back to any questions. Um, Adam Ferugia from uh, Watrix. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Shereen. Look, um, we're, our business is refuse chambers. Um, a little bit challenging at the moment, obviously, with the shift to go to autonomous mining. Um, when we go autonomous mining, generally, uh, there's going to be a lower labour cost and a higher safety standard in the future. Um, so chambers are going to obviously change, change their function a lot. Um, I think in, generally, in general, in my experience, that the mining is generally lagging uh, when it comes to connectivity, especially in the, in the safety aspect for the, the IoT, which has been a big um, common topic of this interview. Um, so I suppose, uh, what are we doing about the challenges? Look, one of the first interim challenges we have moving forward is uh, on brownfield sites. Look, they've got existing assets that are requiring you know, upgrades, um, replacing components, and uh, eventually they're going to become potentially obsolete or redundant. 
um, underground. So, you know, our job is to obviously bring them up to a new higher safety standard. Um, so they meet the new requirements of safety and, and um, connect to the existing infrastructure. Um, another thing obviously we're doing is, look, we've just partnered with a, a global leader, I suppose one of the, the, the world's largest mine engineering and innovation companies globally, which is Murray Engineering. Uh, so together as a collaboration, um, we're pulling in their, their systems for, for connectivity, bringing into chambers. Um, we're also partnering with uh, Holmes Glen Institute of TAFE for training in the mining and tunneling industry. So they've obviously fast track um, underground workers. Um, yeah, and obviously getting guidance from companies like Osmine, uh, the Department of Innovation and Science and the Entrepreneurs Program, which is obviously um, helping helping us guide our way through through the yeah where the industry is going. Um, I suppose another point we had too, Serena, was um, sustainability. So, look, with the sustainability, we're very fortunate with our refuge chambers that um, obviously we're, they're fully recyclable. So we're very fortunate in that aspect. But yeah, the challenge is um, yeah keeping up to date with the new new technology. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Adam. Um, I've got a quick question for you, and it's going back to what Leno talked about. Um, you know, all bodies are getting deeper, they're getting hotter. Yeah. Um, how how are you going to uh, manage the challenge of putting refuge chambers, for example, into these hot environments? Yeah, look, um, you know, batteries, lithium batteries within the within the system itself, the air conditioners, um, they don't like hot temperatures. How do yeah. we how do we get around that? Yeah, look, it is a huge one. Look, Aaron, um, one of the biggest ones is going to be cooling. It's going to be a major challenge. Obviously, the the standard. Uh, mechanism for cooling in refuge chambers is split system air conditioners. Um, we sort of all know that they last up to about 45 degrees C and that's it. Um, so obviously developing new technology to you know cope with higher temperatures of 50 degrees C plus as we go deeper, as well as um, the energy energy source to run the chamber when all other systems fail. So uh, we know that you know current battery technology of whether it be AG, AGM or gel will fail um, anything over sort of 35 degrees or not last. And then you've got the uh, instability of lithium also at higher temperatures. So it is it's a huge challenge. Um, obviously that as the industry goes, the less people will go underground. So um, yeah, just trying to be on top of the hard thing. Thanks Adam. Not sure if anyone else from the floor has got any questions. Um, Probably another one, Adam. Sorry, Shereen. Probably one other quick one is around the challenges of the ever the ever changing uh, requirements legislatively um, throughout Australia. There's we've got you know quite a few different uh, states that have their own view on on safety in mining. Do you see any challenges going forward in the future around that, providing a, a safer working environment? Yeah, look, definitely. It's, it's an interesting comment there too. Um, there's a, bit, a little bit of a disconnect when it comes to refuge chambers. It's sort of in the, in the odd odd basket. So, yeah, I think the level of safety and standard definitely needs to be increased in refuge chambers. Um, connectivity to other other emergency systems definitely needs to be done, which comes back to the IoT, which is obviously why we're partnering with the likes of, say, Murray Engineering to help integrate it into different systems. Um, yeah, obviously, create, creating a new standard in, into the future is, is where we're really pushing. Thanks, Adam. Um, if there's no more questions from the floor, I might uh, go back to Lino um, to provide any, uh, oh, wait, there is one here. Um, just wondering how we can manage missing data from a 180 KTPD, that must mean something to all you guys, um, underground operation yeah. using analytics techniques. Is, is, that, is that something yeah. someone can answer? I think it, it's Christian is asking the question. Uh, Christian, I don't know, one thing would be is there, uh, you know, is looking at the data, and I think the comment was made before about using the existing data in place and trying to find that trend. And is there a way of creating a digital twin that can um, monitor that uh, information, especially those periods where there's no data coming through, um, to inform you of, uh, to give you some, some sort of virtual insight um, in, into into your mine operations, that might be an option. 
Um, so, yeah, sorry, I was saying that uh, perhaps what we can do now is ask Lino to step in here and provide some commentary around the five uh, METS companies and, and their solutions and, um, you know, to give a overall update or otherwise uh, final bits of information from your perspective, Lino. Yeah, thanks, Shireen. Um, so, look, um, great, great um, information there. Um, great presentations by the, by the whole group. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just looking at the run sheet, so it won't be in a chronological order. It'll be in the order of the run sheet. So Adam, um, yeah, look, I'd be, I'd be keen to get some further information on, uh, on your offering uh, for dispersion amongst our group. Um, so, and understand what else you have on offer beyond the, the refuge chamber piece. Um, Stefan, um, again, I'm not sure if you're talking to Cadia, for example, about, uh, about the Emerscent offering, but um, certainly I see the value in um, hang-ups are a perennial problem for the caving industry. So uh, understanding uh, at the moment, having that understanding, being able to, for anyone, you know, a shift supervisor, for example, or even the secondary brake crew to use something like that, to understand what they're dealing with um, is awesome. So be keen to understand what that offering looks like if you're not already talking to our people at Cadia. Yeah, so that draw point I showed is a Cadia draw point. Um, so there you go. <laughs> and tell you, you have been using it for uh, almost a year now. So. Well, there you are. So we're already on it. Good to hear. Yep. Um, so Dylan, it's been a long time since we've interacted, but it'd uh, be good to catch up with you about data mines offering as well. Um, of course, all of, the, all of the software companies are always leapfrogging each other. So uh, good to know how, how you're all competing against each other with your latest offerings. Uh, Alex, uh, I'd be keen to understand the transition between the block cave and the Grassberg open cut as well some whatever um, information you can offer there um, that's something i think across the industry we're going to see more and more again as we go deeper we've got a lot of deposits uh, that are already open cuts that are uh, transitioning into caves so um, great great to see that happening uh, and finally greg um, yeah again uh, be keen to see what uh, what we can look at for uh, a couple of our operations or projects there as well. Um, we are applying 3D seismic at the moment, but be keen to see what your offer is. So again, look, everyone's got great application to all the issues that were described in my opening address. Uh, so uh, thank you. I appreciate the time and effort that's gone in. Thanks, Lino. Aaron, do you have any comments as well? Uh, I've probably got one of it. I can just see there's a, there's quite a few themes here that all link back to what we're trying to do and that's either um, you know, dealing with hotter and deeper mines or trying to get to them faster and I can see there's a link there with, I've had quite a few questions bombarded outside of this meeting around the TBMs um, and you know, how, how can that be used and one of the things, I don't know if Lino mentioned it, but one of the things we've got with TBMs in an underground environment um, uh, compared to a civil, a civil space where they don't have very deep uh, excavations and their data can be gathered quite easily and quickly. Uh, whereas a, a underground mining environment, we go deep. Uh, it's very hard to capture that data in a, in a general sense. And I see, Greg, your technology can really help in that space and help uh, define the ground conditions along a, 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 a tunnel boring or a, um, a, a, along a tunnel boring machine's path. I think there's a, yeah, there's a good synergy there in that and being able to capture that data, that is critical. Look, uh, just, to, just to add to that, Aaron, um, TBMs in a mining space are not out of the question. Um, there's been a couple of applications. Um, Octeti did a drainage tunnel a number of years ago, but uh, master drilling are also, um, they're developing a, a smaller TBM with a tighter turning radius that, um, they're looking for someone to partner with and apply that even in a block caving sense. So people are looking at it. Uh, I think Komatsu might be looking at it through their joy acquisition as well. So it's happening. I think it'll come into play in the next five to 10 years. Be keen to see it given the rates that have been, that have been put up. Definitely. I agree. I agree, Leno, but 
one of the biggest uh, roadblocks to it all is getting that information that we need to know whether along that TBM path so we don't have any issues as we develop down. Yep. Thanks so much for um, those comments, Aaron and, and Lino. Um, obviously, the whole point of these episodes is to bring um, miners and, and, and METs uh, together to talk about particular problems that uh, either one company or otherwise industry is facing. And it sounds like from Aaron's comments um, that it's a collective issue. Um, it's not just there at, at, at Newcrest and, and that Lino's facing, but obviously a number of different ones. Um, obviously, Christian uh, coming uh, to us from, from Chile talking about a whole set of different challenges around the data. So, um, but it sounds like, as, as, as Lino said earlier, data is definitely king. So collecting that and actually being able to interpret it um, and use it is going to be uh, of utmost importance. And, and I think all the companies sort of talked about this as well. Um, I, Aaron, I think you'd agree also um, collaboration and how companies are coming together to ensure their technology is interoperable. Um, and can be used uh, collectively, I think is really important as well. And, and, and that's the sort of message we're getting in all of these episodes. So without further ado, um, as I said, thank you very much to both Aaron and Lino for taking us through this particular um, uh, conversation. But to uh, Alex, Dylan, Greg, Adam and Stefan, thank you for showcasing some of your uh, unique products. Um, as Lino said, he'd, he'd love to take you up on some of those, but it sounds like some other companies would be interested as well um, to see how they fit into different problems and uh, solutions that they have. So thank you all for joining us. Um, if anyone missed the episode, obviously you're watching this um, at a later stage. Uh, hopefully you're all safe and well, and we will see you at another one of the iMark Mets Arena episodes coming up, uh, the project evaluation one in um, September or otherwise the operations one where I can actually probably announce that Christian is actually going to be our speaker um, dialing in from Chile uh, to talk to us about uh, digital operations um, uh, on that episode. And then, like I said, I uh, would love to see you all at iMark online. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.